Huh? It's rare. Yeah. It should be a night show. Yeah. It's a night show. Check. Oh, I said we can fact check. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome everybody oh, yeah. to the last day of the KRK TV show, sad to say. KRK, right? <laughs> and uh, we, we always like to close out our shows with you know, a little event where we can hang out with the artwork, uh, talk with the artists, of course, gain insight into, into what's going on in the gallery as well as the artists see where the artwork came from and give um, everybody an opportunity to um, ask questions about the art, you know, about the work in particular, or uh, how it came to be, how we came to be known as KRK Red. With that, well, if you guys have questions during the talk, just we're going to keep it casual, raise your hands, nothing like formal here. Um, I'm going to let KRK introduce here's you. Our, talk about his work here's our KRK girl. KRK <laughs> TV girl. <laughs> K R K TV. It's K R K TV. So the last that, day of K R K. With that, why don't you um, give us a little intro? How did this all come to be? I was born in Seattle, Washington. One day before Stalin croaked, I was born and Stalin saw me coming and said, and gave it up and died. <laughs> <laughs> he was just really bad. <laughs> Stalin um, was the, the leader of Russia and was responsible for killing like 500 million people. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I started doing art when my mom threw some crayons in my crib and, really? and my first That's scribbles. First. Huh? You were chewing on them first? Yeah, yeah, I discovered that there's more to to art than eating crayons. You could, <laughs> you could draw with them too. And um, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I started doing art right away, like um, uh, in, in kindergarten. I just like, <laughs> I remember really getting into art and, and uh, um, by high school, um, I discovered surrealism. And the way I discovered surrealism is uh, there was a project in my art class and uh, everybody drew a little slip of paper from a hat that was, uh, we were supposed to write, uh, do a, a theme on, um, or a thesis or something on, on a movement of art. And I was really into da Vinci and Renaissance, uh, Italian Renaissance at the time. And so I was hoping to get, you know, Renaissance. And I pulled this slip of paper out this is like 1967 or 68. <laughs> uh, to give you an idea of like what people thought of surrealism at the time, people didn't really know too much what surrealism was at that time. Um, so I got this slip of paper that said surrealism and I had no idea what it was. I was like 14. And the art teacher said, oh, you should look it up, you know, go to the school library and you know, you'll probably like it. And so I started reading uh, uh, books on um, surrealism and saw a really good book on Dolly. And to Dolly just changed my life. You know, I was like, wow, you can do really weird things and you don't have to paint landscapes and portraits, you know, and, and that's, that's what. Where did you, uh, you grow up? Um, well, I was born in Seattle, but I kind of grew up in Southern California and was uh, raised you know, in the Southern California scene, like uh, when I was four years old, I met Walt Disney because my my uncle worked for uh, Disney. He uh, he ran Man, Main Street, and um, 
So I was exposed to that kind of stuff. I remember I was like four years old and I went to, uh, uh, we, we met Disney right at the, <laughs> the main gate because my uncle was, you know, we're real close to him. And I remember, you know, shaking his hand and he, he uh, you know, brought me up to his, his little office, which is at Disneyland. There's this little office in the beginning of Main Street. And uh, I remember sitting watching him work at his desk, you know, and, and um, he asked me if I like Donald Duck, and, you know, I told him I like Donald Duck. I was there just there for a couple of minutes, then we went back down the stairs. They rebuilt that little office for, for the historical sake, and, and um, then, you know, I was just so excited, it was so great, and I was walking down Main Street, and it was just, just, the, just the best day of my life, and it was just really excited, and I just felt my, felt my stomach, stomach start to stir and churn up, and I just puked all the over the, the cobbles, cobbles on the side, side or whatever, whatever, and so on Main Street, and yeah. It's so that was so 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 but um but um so um so um um after high school high school uh, uh, you know I kinda kinda turned into an into the MP and uh with the with the South Lake Tahoe for a while and uh and uh from there and there I started uh just getting adventurous and going around the country and Doing stuff. I, I went to Madison, Wisconsin in uh, '76 and started uh, doing uh, artwork for the music industry. Um, and uh, radical rags like uh, Mad City Music Sheets, these socialist newspapers and stuff like this. And um, uh, um, I, I kind of started a company called Key Fried and Visual, and it was called KRV. And but I changed that to KRK, Key Fried and Creation, spelling creations with a K. And so when I moved back to California, I only stayed in Madison for like four years. Um, I opened up a little studio in Encinitas, California, and I had a big sign on my storefront window that said KRK. And I started doing artwork for hardcore. Southern California hardcore bands like Manifest Destiny and uh, bands were like Moral Majority were going on at the time like that. And uh, this band Manifest Destiny, they, they became pretty good friends. And they'd come in and they didn't call me Keith, they called me KRK, kind of, you know, sarcastically because it said KRK on my, my uh, window. And that's why I started calling myself KRK. And that was around 84. So that's how long I've been KRK instead of Keith. So so now. Illustration, like posters, albums. Yeah, yeah. I did uh, album for Manifest Destiny, which is a really cool collectible record. Now it was on Mystic Records. Mystic Records was did uh, did Suicidal Tendencies' first record. Uh, My mommy's dead was on Su on Mystic Records and all this stuff. Um, but. Uh, uh, so around that time, I was um, doing a, a bootleg record covers. Of, uh, bootleg records were were these recordings of uh, live shows, like uh, you know the Grateful Dead and all sorts of bands, and um, they were um, they weren't counterfeit records. They weren't like records, you know. Counterfeit record is totally, you know, a legal thing. They make a, try to pass off a record as the real thing, but but um, unauthorized. Uh, um, bootleg records where they'd, they'd go up to the soundboard and they'd ask the guy if they could record and uh, the band would let them and they'd make records for like fans and stuff and these records were really cool at the time around the, the early 80s and um, uh, so but, but when they came out they were just had a slip sheet on the cover they weren't really good art so this one guy David Rosen uh, hired me to do a bunch of covers to um, uh, make those, those, those covers better. Uh, and the only one that got produced, I did about a dozen of them, but the only one that got produced was one for um, the police called, uh, uh, it was Message in a Bottle, and it was a, a live, their live recording of their, their tour. Um, but the rest of the art got confiscated by the FBI. Uh, and, and all that art never got to be seen, and the, who knows what the FBI did with them when they busted uh, Ed Rosen for, for doing that because, you know, it was, 
you know, not, uh, you know, the, 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 it was the record companies that chased him that, you know, got him to, to quit. But uh, so that, that art, you know, wound up in the hands of the kids of, you know, the FBI agents were in the furnace, you know. But maybe it's, it's, it's in record storage and it's immortalized. Uh, hopefully, it'd be really nice to think that. It was, it was the best work I ever did because wow. I really got into it and I was really happy. I did Eric Clapton, all sorts of cool records. So when um, Ed got busted, I was living, I, I had moved back to California and I was started to work on a Devo um, bootleg. Um, and that art couldn't get used for, for what Ed wanted it to do, so I took the art and uh, made some posters from that. And they're really cool posters. They, they, they had a, a gimmick in it, so if you put on 3D glasses and you look through the red lens, there was a little girl in the middle of it being whipped by Devo. And um, when she had clothes on, but when you look through the red lens, her her clothes would be filtered out and she was naked. <laughs> this is a tr tricky thing. So somehow uh, a friend of mine, uh, Karen Hansen, uh, brought that to a party, some Southern California party where Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo was at. And she showed him that poster and he really dug it. And she came back to my studio in Encinitas and said, Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo. So I said, oh, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> what are the odds, you know? But she said, the bad news is he doesn't know how to contact you. You know, what, you know, it's really too bad, but put your phone number on the back of another poster and, you know, maybe another party will happen again. But yeah, you know, like lightning doesn't hit twice, you know. So two days later, she, I got a call from Mark Mothersbaugh. I was at my folks house watching TV and it was Mark Mothersbaugh and he asked me to go to Hollywood and work on a project called The Brainwasher, which was a, a fan letter news magazine. And, uh, and when I went there uh, to, to Hollywood, um, uh, I went to, not to Mark's house, but Lorraine Newman's house. Lorraine Newman was one of the original coneheads of Saturday Night Live. You know, she was the girl, the, their, their daughter, you know. And um, her house was totally, it was really, you know, big kind of mansion type house, but but uh, it was totally white and minimal. Minimalism was really in at the time. And there was nothing in the house except white walls and stuff, you know? And, and I looked through the window as I was approaching the house and I saw Mark Mothersbaugh for the first time and he was looking just, just engrossed at something on a table, this big square marble table. And this was the first time I saw him and they, they were just uh, starting to do um, the uh, record uh, Oh No, It's Devo which came out after Whip It, you know. So um, that's, that's how I got to met, meet him and we started working on projects and I, I moved to Hollywood from Encinitas from that, that gallery soon after that. And I was living pretty close to Mark so we hung out for a while. And that was really, you know, fun time. I was really poor but it was cool because of the eventual, you know, uh, occasional visits by, by Mark and it was, it was pretty fun. But uh, what kind of projects were you doing? When you uh, one cool thing was uh, something called uh, Monster Monster Women. He had these big silk screen. We went to a, a, a studio that was a really high end uh, silk screen place, and uh, they they had I, I never saw an automatic uh, silk screen machine before. Yeah, it slides a big. You know, you just press a button and put on the ink, and it and these these posters that he did were like like three by five feet, you know, on paper. And what he did is he found like all, you know, like girly magazines from the 40s and 50s and drew like monster heads, like, like weird rooster headed women and stuff like that. And um, he had me, uh, because to do a transparency uh, for the silk screening at the time was would, was really cost prohibitive, he, he gave me big sheets of acetate and I hand inked the, the, yeah, you know. So that's, that was, you know, kind of technical work. We also printed um, the, the like second or third edition to a, a book that Mark did 
called My Struggle by Boogie Boy. Boogie Boy is a little kid on the old Devo videos that stuck the fork in the, the toaster, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> and he made this book, this little cool red book that looked like uh, Mao Zedong's red, uh, you know, little red book, you know, but it's called My Struggle, and it's this weird ramblings on by, by, uh, by Boogie Boy. And uh, um, he wrote it uh, while he was at Kent State um, in uh, college. Um, that's, that's how Devo met, uh, Mark met Jerry Casali of Devo. And Kent State, during the time when the, the four got shot at Kent State, and you know that famous, there's a famous picture of a, a person dying in the girl's arms, you know? Well, the same thing happened to Jerry Casali. A friend was killed by the, the, the police at Kent State. And, uh, you know, there was kind of a legend was, that's how Devo got inspired, was born in that moment, but that's not really true. But, but uh, Mark met uh, Jerry at, uh, uh, because he saw some art that he, he had at uh, some shows at, at Kent State. And that's when they got together and started doing things at and the college and uh, you know it was the early days of Devo when they they did these weird mutant things and wrapped themselves up in plastic and trash around and did all this weird shit. Pre -Devo. And, yeah, pre-Devo, pre-studio Devo, you know, yeah. But um, I met him years after that. The first the first concert I saw of them was was in San Diego and that was the Oh No, It's Devo tour. That was around 82 or so, you know. So you've been immersed in it. Yeah, in yeah. Basically. Just, uh, you know, really influenced it. Yeah. You know, Devo, Mark, is is uh, more than just a musical band. It's like a philosophy and a style, a lifestyle, mm -hmm. you know, because he's really got an all-encompassing kind of, a, you know, attitude and stuff and, and style. You know, he's like, is great as an artist as he is a musician and uh, so um, a lot of what I do is uh, influenced by him the the work that I do for um, on Instagram is a lot like his postcard art uh, every day he would do a, um, a postcard um, type of art um, with a brush pen and it was like a, a diary type of thing and uh, so he introduced me to a brush pen that's that's you know brush pen is a is a great thing as long as you can keep a tip on it yeah. you know they those those pentel brush people suck they they you know they started making a really good product that, that really kept the point but you know as that popularity of brush pens got on i think they they uh you that's know slacked on their the the, yeah. the production of them and now they split after a short while, so you have to keep buying them for twenty bucks. And just, just want them to know that. <laughs> what? Get the Japanese ones. Yeah, yeah, but well, the the problem with those is the Japanese ones. The ink is not. Um, you can't opaque over it. You know, it bleeds, and it's it dries. Takes longer to dry. It smears. It doesn't erase good. And that was what was good about the Pentel pocket brush pen. <laughs> it was my main axe, you know, but then they started making them crummy. You can't trust big business. <laughs> this is also a waste around the time the trip to the subgenius. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a, the, the, the word, main word there is serendipity. Um, what happened is, this story is just amazing. Um, when I met Mark that, that day that I was telling you about at Larry Newman's house, we started working on that, this project called The Brainwasher. And he started bringing out these letters and stuff and all this weird things from uh, Devo fan, fan uh, uh, letters, you know, in a big cardboard box. And uh, we, there wasn't any place to really look at this stuff. So we were looking at it on Lauren's bed in her bedroom, you know, just pouring out these letters and stuff. And um, uh, one of the things, was this the pamphlets of uh, the Church of the Subgenius. It was the early days of the Church of the Subgenius. And there was really cool, like neat underground type of, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, printing, you know, this is like uh, 
weird philosophy and, and great graphics and stuff. Really, really cool kind of a, Church of the Subgenius, Bob Dobbs. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, you got to become members of ministers. Anyway, um, so years later, only, you know, like four or five years ago, um, I met, I was at the Safeway in Martinez, and I was, I had just got back from a Devo concert, and I had a Devo shirt on, and a lady came up to me, and she said, how was the show? And I said, what show? And I didn't realize it was wearing the shirt, and we started talking about Devo, and then she said, well, my, my husband is Philo Drummond, and Philo Drummond is the guy that created the Church of the Subgenius with Ivan Stang and another guy who died, I can't remember his name. But um, uh, so if you are familiar with the Church of the Subgenius, the face Bob Dobbs, Philo Drummond is the guy that found that face because he worked for um, uh, uh, the telephone company making the paste ups for the ads and stuff. And he found this, this face in old clipper art, you know. And she said, my husband is Philo Drummond and he lives just right across the street and so after all these years, I, you know, finally got to meet him and we became really good friends. He just moved from Martinez uh, just about a month ago and uh, he's, he's going to, Stephen, where was the, the where was he going to move? What did, where did he find a farm or he's looking Southern for a farm? Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's Southern Kentucky. Kentucky? I think so. Is it it's Kentucky? Kentucky? He bought some acreage. Yeah, yeah, well, he's going to. He's, he, he, he. Uh, <laughs> He worked for years at for the yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, but uh, you know so when I met him he had just he had just uh, uh, retired and and was you know like free with his life he was really living it up because uh, he he had money and stuff but working with this, this company so when he moved he uh, you know had enough money to to find some farm like he wants to do. And uh, so, but uh, what Search of the Subgenius does every year, they have this thing called the X Festival because they expect uh, these, these flying saucers to come and take all the subgenius away. Subgenius to the It doesn't happen one year, it doesn't excuse. Yeah, yeah they, they, they figure out, they keep miscalculating, you know, some numbers is wrong, you know, there's some really, hardcore legitimate reasons why they, they keep suspending it. But uh, uh, so now he's gonna be closer to the, uh, those activities at the, um, at the, the X Festival. The uh, what? He's yeah, yeah, he's. he's <laughs> um, also a uh, thing that I do every year, I didn't do this last year because I did this show, it was one of the reasons I wanted to concentrate on this show. But um, uh, there's a, a thing called the devotional in um, Cleveland, and uh, uh, we uh, tell Devo heads, devo de devotees get together, and, and uh, Jerry Casale almost every year goes there and, and plays with uh, a band called the Spud Boys, which they, they cover Devo songs just perfectly, they're, they're amazing. And um, I go there with my band and play um, theremin. Uh, my band is called Can the Magic Corner God? And uh, and I, I sell art and stuff there, and it's a it's a really fun thing, you know. It's a thing I do try to do there. So every August, like sixteenth uh, or something, yeah, something, something like that, you know, like every year in Cleveland. <laughs> I wish they'd do it in in Hollywood, is where they were, should really do it because that's where Devo lives, and you know, it'd be a, a much cooler thing. But. Anybody have any questions Get about the question. that zone? Area? It's my doctor. He knows I, I, <laughs> my, my, my heart might give out any second, so my doctor's here. He follows me around all the time to, just to make sure I don't drop. Yeah, That's why you got No question? You, what, uh, sir, Robert? Um, is there any sort of thing that you're looking forward to do, like a certain medium or something that you haven't done yet art-wise? Yeah, right here I want to do um, some bronzes. Uh, I've tried to do the bronze in, in time for this show, but it's uh, easier said than done. But I've got some good ideas for that. Uh, the big thing that uh, um, 
I'm waiting to do that that's going to come out in November at the designer con is my first toy uh, mohawk which is this little little guy and he's got these big huge bristles like a Statue of Liberty bristles and every one it's a different color and he's on a skateboard and he's holding a, a lit joint in his in his left hand and he's skating and so that's that's going to be really exciting I have, I have to do more toys if that's successful I'll do maybe toys that look like globs that bounce and talk or whatever something globular things. Um, you have a good body of work here. There's, there's work from on a lot of different mediums. We have the plates, we have works on paper. Um, this piece behind you, I mean, you want to comment on this, maybe some particular piece of image? This piece yeah. has um, been hanging around for a long time. I did it uh, about ten, over 10 years ago mm -hmm. and I've changed it. I, I have intended to, to keep changing it through the years, yeah. you know, if it, it didn't sell. You know, <laughs> and, and um, uh, at, at the time I was living in San Francisco, and I, I um, got into. Uh, can I stand up? Uh, um, I used all sorts of weird materials. I went to a special uh, glass shop in San Francisco and got this this really cool bubbly glass made, and got a, a cylinder of plexiglass for for back here. And there's these really weird uh, special um, green. Uh, uh, LCD lights behind there and made a thematic, uh, you know, if you went going to do a, electric art, you know, something electric, you know, there's always a problem with the, yeah. how to get the electric there. So, you know, one way around it is to do work the cord into the art, <laughs> yeah, you know? So easy. Usually I'm trying to hide it. Yeah. Yeah. The only other way to do is like put it behind there and cut a groove in the the wall or something and plaster over it or what you know what are you can do this is called two to tango mm -hmm. and um, this guy is made of bondo uh, like a um, you know a, um, uh, what do you call it it's this stuff that you <laughs> use for auto body stuff this is a kind of a found piece lettering mm -hmm. and um, um, just different techniques there are a lot of really jammed a lot of stuff in there uh, the plates uh, this is the first time I've ever done plates, you know, courtesy of the compound gallery is really great. I've got to work on that. My, my Mark, my brother Mark uh, does plates that are made by uh, pressure printing in Denver, but uh, there are multiples and they're d done in a totally different uh, kind of a uh, technique. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're mass produced, they're printed. You know, they, they're really colorful, really great, but these are one of a kind, you know, they're, they're really fun to do. Uh, there's, uh, this is basically supplying them with a stack of plates and some glaze, and then we did the pattern. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of our second round. We did, you know, yeah, we yeah, had right, yeah. We had, did another round. And yeah. We'll do more, yeah. 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 Well, we'll, I'll bring in a gross at a time. And Functional. <laughs> <picture or whatever. laughs> yeah, uh, ceramics is, you know, I watch uh, PBS sometimes and these, uh, or, or uh, Antique Roadshow mm -hmm. and see these, these ceramic, you know, geniuses that have like worked on glaze and stuff all their life and they've gotten famous for doing certain techniques and yeah. stuff and it's something that, you know, <laughs> kind of have to dedicate your life to, yeah. you know, and it's, it's can be really engrossing, you know. Uh, oh, you your white coat looks really nice yeah, it is a doctor coat, and I got it at the um, at the mall. Uh, I forgot the name. Maybe you're familiar with that place in the mall um, that sells a lot of whites and uh, um, doctors things and scrubs. 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 I did want to ask at the show. Someone said that you taught your brother how to paint. So how did you influence your other family members? No, I didn't. That's that's an overkill. I didn't really teach him how to paint. He teaches me how to paint and I teach him how to paint, you know, different little trade, you know, little uh, uh, techniques and stuff. But um, m more to the to the point, truth is um, I'm 10 years older than he is and he he uh, was influenced by me and saw, you know, I think the, the, the most honest thing you can say, say is that while I had to change my attitude from, you know, copying Van Gogh's and doing, 
that stuff and learning about surrealism in high school, he was born seeing nothing but weird art for me. So he had a jump start, you know. I've never seen him really do anything that looks like a landscape or something. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, he's so. come from a really creative family, not only that, your other brother's a collector and yeah. curator. Steven's the cur cur curator. Amazing. I have two brothers and two sisters and and uh and it's, it's interesting, you guys obviously all kind of feed off. The, they're yeah. all talented, but it's all uh the question of productivity, you know. They, my sister Janine could be a great sculptress, but she doesn't want to sit down. I think that's what makes an artist when it comes down to you. A person who wants to sit down on their ass all day and go like this, <laughs> you know? And it takes, you know, it takes a certain kind of brain, you know, and, and uh, that's, that's, it's stick to you know. That's the, the part of truth. Unless you can come up with a clever thing like naked chicks rolling in paint and uh, you know, bring a lot of paparazzi and have them <laughs> roll on the floor. And say, oh, yeah, great, you know, that, but that's only gonna last a year or so. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. a good job before. In the house, obviously, he was a creative household, or is still. What, excuse it's me? It's a creative household, I mean, right? Oh, yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> my my niece Justine is a great photographer. She, you know, if I if I was a millionaire, I'd have a studio, a photo studio, so you could work. Do <laughs> she's she's to, yeah, and her boyfriend's a great artist, Mason. There's a lot of creativity. Anybody have any thoughts? Some things are you thinking? Think of something. Well, I, I wind up yeah. doing acrylic on masonite a lot, but the past three years or so, it's more than that maybe, um, I've been doing works on paper uh, for their 11 by 17s for uh, Instagram because, because uh, um, it's just a really quick way to, to do ideas and stuff. It's, it's really fun. Um, it's, it's much different than a painting. You know, painting requires sketching and then transferring the sketching onto a, the surface, which is, I use masonite. <coughs> but um, with these works on paper, um, it's really fluid. You know, I can, I can jot down all sorts of weird, you know, ideas and, uh, and uh, you know, they're, they're almost, some of them are actually uh, like studies for paintings. You know, they're, they're good enough that, you know, I'd really like to make them into a painting like, uh, this last one I just did that my, my brother Mark liked so much he bought for me. Um, I really want to paint it, you know, a serious acrylic painting of it. And that's usually acrylic on masonite. Uh, people have been painting on masonite since it was invented in the like 20s or 30s. I think it was invented in the 30s. And there was a bad, uh, you know, um, info, misinformation that that it's, it's not archival to paint on masonite, but what they're thinking of is masonite, you know, in the, if it's weathered, if it's outside, well, of course, rain and stuff, you know, destroys masonite, it's not for like that, but for, for painting, it's, it's great. It's a, real, it's a really smooth thing, uh, a smooth surface. And uh, years ago, uh, when I worked at the, uh, uh, a gallery called the Harcourts Gallery, and, Powell Street in San Francisco. I was still a teenager and I saw this, this artist uh, doing trompe l'oeil uh, paintings, uh, which is photographic, uh, you know, fools the eye. It looks like real photographs uh, of oil on, and it was on masonite. And um, he would, you know, they're just little small squares, but they were just so perfect that he'd go through hundreds of dollars worth the brushes just for, you know, these, these small pieces and they were viewed with, with um, magnifying glasses over them because you, they were that perfect, you know? And uh, that was Masonite, you know? And they'd never, you know, this, this classy uh, gallery, they didn't think that it was like, you know, not, not archival to paint, paint on Masonite. So it's uh, usually Masonite, but this paper that I do is uh, 
is bristle for ply bristle, you know, for people that are into technique. And I, I uh, do a lot of uh, um, collage of uh, uh, custom made paper, paper that's like imported from India and stuff, like these weird, weird papers that um, really make the art sometimes, sometimes they're the, this weird glittery paper and I use a lot, a lot of techniques that, uh, you know, that I can experiment on with these pieces that, that uh, you know, is easier to do than maybe, you know, a painting. You know? I'm into techniques, I like, like inventing weird techniques and doing unusual stuff. So we had a visit to Globe Studios and uh, <laughs> Club. it's, it's Club. Club. <laughs> and the, um, it's surrounded by, uh, you can see where your work comes from, old illustrations, like popcorn bags, mm -hmm. cartoon figures. Popcorn boxes, I, I collect popcorn boxes real seriously, I got a couple of shelves of them. Yeah. There's always that kind of like 50s, 40s, 50s yeah. era illustration. Yeah, yeah. 40s, 50s. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of old cartoons, like the Flasher Studio. Fla the Flashers um, did Betty Boop and um, Popeye and the Superman uh, cartoons. And uh, the, their early cartoons, which uh, you're showing on the TV here. Yeah, we have one cartoon. Yeah. That's called Swing You Sinners, and it's just totally surreal and weird. <coughs> Sorry thing, yeah. Uh, popcorn boxes, I love because uh, popcorn boxes, um, they have to make them cheaply. They don't, they don't do, uh, get into too much printing there, so it's usually just red and blue ink. But uh, so they, the, the artwork is really great. This combination is really, really nice uh, stuff on a white, field usually, you know, <laughs> so, and toys, old toys. Yeah, the studio is definitely it's just, a reflection of it's the work, it's inspiration it's of that. <laughs> the studio is a micro, small <laughs> studio because I, I had a house in Oakland um, uh, in between Shattuck and Telegraph on 56th Street is where I had a house and it was, you know, it was the biggest place I lived at for a while, but I couldn't keep up the rent. And uh, so I moved in with my brother Stephen and had to convert the garage into a studio and bedroom. And so I had to jam everything I had from Oakland into there. And, uh, but you know, it's functional and, and you know, the things I'm doing now, this Instagram art, you know, is, is really doable there. You know, but when I do want to do a big painting, it really becomes a problem yeah. <laughs> because it doesn't even fit through the doors. <laughs> yeah. I really like doing large paintings too, if I can. I, I used to do some murals. I'd like to get into some more murals, but murals are, you know, tricky. You know, um, you want to make sure that you can paint a mural and it's going to stay there. You know, I mean, I've seen so many. Yeah, you know. Building kid building. Yeah, yeah, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> any, any other thoughts? I just want to say, I've seen your studio, and it's amazing the amount of art that you can create in such a small space. <laughs> seriously, I have to. The drawing table. I've, I've, I've trained myself to move from small. Yeah, no I mean, it's inspirational, it. really. I can't make. I can't bring in paper that's too thick because it fills up. No large gestures. Yeah, yeah. There's no ballroom dancing in there. Well, we'll be here till seven. You guys can hang out and enjoy the show some more. I can chat and ask some questions. All right. Yeah, I mean, we have, um, oh, the book as well. You want to comment on your Oh, book? yeah, the book is uh, called Double Talk. Um, can we get a book? I'll, I'll show. This book was made uh, around five years ago now. Um, my brother published it under a Porter House. Um, uh, books and um, what it is is double talk refers to homographs and a homograph is a word that one or pronounced two words that are pronounced differently and two have different but sometimes related meanings and are spelled the same like for example the word wind and wind 
usually, you know, if you're in school, the uh, teacher will bring that word up, you know, and and so um, somehow somewhere along the line, I thought of words like that, and I wondered how many words there are like that, and you know, is there more than just wind and oh yeah, um, lead and lead, and so I came up with like a dozen of them. I thought, wow, there's that many, and then I. <laughs> and I went online and looked up homographs, and there's like 140 of them. <laughs> some, some of them are very unusual uh, words like nun and nun, which is the, the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet and things like that. Um, so, uh, so what I did is I took these words and I did two things. I put them in one or two sentences, both the words, and illustrated um, something to go with that phrase, like this is hillbilly Hank Greg. I taught my sow to sow all them seeds her own dang self. So the word sow and sow. This was the first one I illustrated for the book row and row, and there was a, there was a big row about which of the skippers could row the best. So row and row. Um, yeah, this is the, the best uh, black and white work that, that I did at the time. This one, um, without warning, the dove dove right on, down on poor little Billy. <laughs> so something, I try to do different styles, um, like uh, sometimes I do this kind of uh, cartoony style, but and I'd pour it out and pour, really get into it and something like this one, which is really, you know, heavy stip, stippling and stuff like that. You know. Some uh, homographs are, uh, the words are pronounced differently, but, but um, they're, they're kind of close, like con contest and contest. You know, the juicy ones like live and live, that's, that's the one you want. <laughs> Unfortunately, the tambourine player did not live long enough to give one last live performance with his band, The Four Flounders. There's a picture of him. <laughs> so, evening and evening. You know, a lot of words you don't really think of. Yeah. These books that are here, I drew something. Uh, there's original art in the, this blank page on every one of them with these stamps, which you can only get here is, you know. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for coming out. Enjoy. Please come around. Thank you. Thanks a lot.